morning, so I'd like you to turn to the book of Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter 8, we had a a phenomenal opportunity, I felt, last week to look at the story of Mephibosheth and see the work that God has done in us, the work that we're able to enjoy now. I'd like for us tonight, if we could, to for 40 or so minutes, Set aside all of the events and all of the things that are on your mind regarding what we've got to do and parties we're attending and food we're cooking and all of that. Let's move beyond that and focus on eternity tonight. Paul made a statement in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are eternal. The things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen, however, are eternal. The verse immediately before that, he describes the affliction that he was undergoing. And he described it by the word light affliction. I'm not sure what you would consider to be light affliction. What Paul experienced I would not at all consider to be light affliction. He describes some of the affliction that he suffered. He said that he was in labors more abundant and stripes above measure. In other words, he was beaten with stripes beyond what he could count. Prisons more frequent. In deaths oft, in other words, the reality of possibly losing his life was frequently there. Of the Jews, five times received I, 40 stripes save one. He was beaten five times when you would get uh, the cat of nine tails where you would receive 39 lashes, five times. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. Three, three, uh, Three times he suffered shipwreck, spent a night and a day in the deep, Journeyings often in perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils of mine own countrymen, perils by the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness. Just light affliction. Just everyday stuff. I don't know about you, but I I look at a passage such as that, and I wonder, how in the world is Paul able to conclude that is light affliction? The reason is where his focus was. You see, he was able to see beyond today and tomorrow and was able to see even beyond his life and his focus was on eternity. And that tonight is where I hope and pray we're able to, for a few moments, take and put our focus. Because regardless of where you are going to Uh, live your life, and regardless of all of the challenges that you are going to face, every single person in here tonight is going to spend an eternity somewhere. That is the reality. For those of us who are saved, it is an eternity of unparalleled bliss and unparalleled joy such as we have never, ever, ever seen. Heaven is beyond any kind of description that you and I are able to come up with. In fact, when you read John's account in Revelation, you will find him describing heaven by the term as. In other words, this is the closest thing that I can relate it to you for. I've had the privilege of seeing some beautiful sights across the country. But yet the Bible teaches me that I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for those that love him. I've not seen it yet. I've heard some amazing sounds and some amazing songs. I wonder what the song in heaven will be like. You see, it's unparalleled. The issue of eternity comes to light in Romans chapter 8 and the verses I would like for us to consider tonight, beginning in verse number 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God 
and joint heirs with Christ. We're going to stop there, though hopefully we will uh, continue beyond that. We're looking at some of the results of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And one of those is found here in verses 16 and the first part of 17, and it is the confirmation of salvation. The most important question that you will ever answer is where you are going to spend an eternity. And if I can in some way get our minds tonight to see beyond the temporal, see beyond that which is visible to us, and ponder for just a little while eternity. I believe with all of my heart that several things are going to come to light. The matter of salvation is one of them. The glory of your inheritance is another one of them. Your earthly pursuits is another evaluation that will inevitably come about. And then the perspective on trials and why God allows some of these things. All of this is going to come when we're allowed or when we are able to take our minds off of the immediate and consider eternity for just a little bit. Many individuals, particularly those who were saved as a young child, often struggle with the assurance of their salvation. I know some of you were saved at a later age in your life and you've testified of an absolutely miraculous change that took place. Some still had a struggle with certain things and those struggles still exist uh, today even though we've been saved for years and years and years. Some, the moment they were saved, just seemingly broke all sorts of habits instantaneously. Others, it took quite some time to go through. For those who were saved, however, at a young age, there in essence isn't the dramatic visible change that is evidenced by someone who is saved later on in life. And because of that, oftentimes we will start questioning, well, am I truly saved or not saved? I was saved as a young boy. There is very little of my life that I could even really point to and describe times when I remember being an unsaved person. It wasn't like that for me. For some of you in here tonight, based on your own testimonies, I know it's the exact opposite. There was a time, and you may not remember the day, you may not remember the hour, and, and those things are okay. But you can point to a definite time and say, this was when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and this is the result of my life. This is how God has taken and forever changed if you can't do that, you are missing out on this very first point on eternity. The most important question and the most important decision that you will ever make in your life is what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? Because the answer to that is the answer on which all of eternity hinges. Now, we could go on and we could cite a number of reasons as to why someone may doubt his salvation. It is quite possible that they are, in fact, unsaved. Let's at least establish that premise. It's very possible that in this reality that they are actually unsaved. When dealing with someone doubting their salvation, don't talk them into their salvation. Okay? God may very well be doing a work in that person's heart, and they may be coming to an understanding that they actually never did place their trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. I'm amazed at how many young people will say, oh, you know, everybody always thinks I'm saved. <laughs> now, you might be surprised. Okay? There are a whole lot of godly individuals who may look at some young people and say, mm, I just do not see the fruit there. Does that mean that we're being harsh and judgmental and all of this nonsense? Well, you can take it that way. But personally, I'd rather tick you off for just a few moments and see you spend an eternity in heaven than to just go on and pat you on the back and then see you spend an eternity in hell. 
I can deal with your anger for a few moments. I remember questioning an individual's salvation. Took the opportunity and said, you know, I, I question based on your lifestyle and the decisions that you are making, are you truly saved? Boy, as soon as I asked that question, the fireworks went off. He was angry. Now, I would be angry. I would be hurt if you questioned my salvation. I, I would think, certainly, sh surely I've lived my life in such a way that somebody wouldn't look at me and say, well, man, you know, I question his salvation. I would be hurt from that standpoint. But, you know, if you ask me to share my testimony tonight, well, I'm not going to be angry in the least bit. I don't know of any saved person in here tonight who would be angry over sharing their testimony. No, we're not talking about going and sharing all of the bad that we ever did. We're talking about sharing the grace of God. That's where the testimony lies. Testimony doesn't lie in the stupid decisions that you made as an unsaved person. The testimony doesn't lie in the depth of sin in which you were saved from. The testimony lies in the grace of God. That's where salvation is. So it's possible that a person struggling with salvation is struggling because he is genuinely not saved. It's also possible for some other reasons. A person, for example, who is not growing in his relationship with the Lord will likewise struggle with the matter of the assurance of salvation. You're not feeding the new nature. You are constantly feeding the old nature. When you do that, all sorts of doubts are going to begin to come into your mind. Am I truly saved? How many of us in here, especially those who are saved at a younger age, and I don't want a show of hands, but how many of us in here have thought, well, man, you know, would a saved person do that? I wonder if I'm really saved just because of some action uh, that we did. Now, I want us to take, and I'm going to not deal with this from a standpoint of a person being unsaved. I want to deal with this from the matter of the assurance of salvation. The Bible provides us with a number of answers. The book of 1 John, and I don't have time to go through it, is a book that test centers on proofs of an individual being saved. So, for example, when you read through that, you'll find verses such as, He that uh, hateth his brother. Well, I had a brother. I had three of them. One of them I hated at times. Okay? Uh, I really did. I mean, I, I, you look at me, I can't believe I did. I couldn't stand him. He couldn't stand me. The feeling was mutual. The other two, uh, Dave was in the Marine Corps when I was probably four, and Jim uh, was married, I think, when I was five or six. I didn't, you know, I didn't really know them. But Mark, man, I couldn't stand him. Okay? And there were many days I hated him. Does that mean I was unsaved? You know what? I couldn't continuously hate him without any sense of remorse. And there's the key. Continuous action that does not have any sense of remorse. The person who walks in darkness, not in light. Hey, have you ever made a decision that was not a godly decision? Yes. Does that mean you're unsaved? No, if you are saved when you made that ungodly decision, you weren't happy about it inside here. The Holy Spirit of God convicted you and worked in your heart and you knew that what you were doing was wrong. A person who doesn't have that, not a good indicator okay, of salvation. A person who is completely calloused towards the things of God and seemingly has no care or concern, it's not a good indicator of salvation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 provides us, though, with another testimony regarding the genuineness of your salvation. And it is the testimony of the Holy Spirit. There is a work, according to verse number 16 of Romans 8, that is going on between God's spirit and man's spirit. Who is the one doing this work? It's the Holy Spirit. Notice the Bible says, the spirit itself, don't let the word itself throw your thinking off. Okay, The Holy Spirit is not some mystical force that is unable to be explained, but only able to be experienced. He is a person. He is a person who is actively involved in the life of every single believer. 
And this is what the Holy Spirit of God does to my spirit, to man's spirit, to those who are genuinely God's child. Here's what he does. The Bible says that the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. The word bear witness with, that phrase right there, translation of one word, here is the idea. It provides supporting evidence by testifying. It comes along and confirms it in some way he supports by testimony. It's the same word that was used back in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15 when the conscience was described, uh, the law which was written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. The conscience is coming along and saying, you know what, I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't do that. Unsaved people have a conscience. Okay? Now, they may dull that conscience. Saved people can be insensitive in their conscience. But you have a conscience, you have an idea of what is right and what is wrong. There are certain behaviors that are known to be right, and there are certain behaviors that are known to be wrong. The verse here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 is saying that for every child of God, the Holy Spirit is coming along and He is confirming with my spirit. And what is it that He is confirming? The end of verse number 16. That we are the children of God. Now the tense behind it is like, who cares about all this tense stuff? Let me tell you, you care. Because it is a continuous and unending testifying that is going on. Aren't you thankful that God the Holy Spirit doesn't just do it once and then leave you to the rest of your life? He is continuously testifying to this fact that you are God's child, that you belong to Him. Notice the word are. That we are the children of God. Not that we are going to become the children of God, but we are presently the children of God. And so the verse is saying, well, there is a work that is going on that exists between God and me. That work is the Holy Spirit who is inside saying, you know what? I know that I am saved. If you were to come up to me and ask me this question, well, do you know where you would go if you were to die tonight? I know I would go to two places. Number one, a funeral home. <laughs> okay, that's my body. That's not the one that matters. There is not a shadow of doubt in my mind where I'm going when I pass from this earth. None whatsoever. Is it possible for a believer to have that kind of assurance? It is not only possible, it is expected. Because this is exactly what God is doing. So well, I don't have that kind of assurance. Why not? That's the issue. And that question has to be answered tonight. Why not? Why do you not have that assurance? Say, well, I'm, I, I believe that Jesus died. And I, I do this. I, I believe. And I, okay, let me, let me just pray again. Is that trust? Still isn't. Okay? What happens when you do wrong? Do you sense the convicting work of the Holy Spirit? The believer will. If you can go on and live your life any way you want and not be convicted and care less what mom and dad and the preacher says and the school teachers say, and that list goes on and on and on, there's some questions that are there. There are some questions that say, as sweet and angelic as you are, it is quite possible that you are a fallen angel, not a redeemed angel, <laughs> okay? It's quite possible, and perhaps even likely, that you are unsaved. It would break my heart if, having been now the pastor for, hard to believe, concluding seven years, some of the young people who have grown up throughout this ministry, those who have come in to the paths of this ministry and perhaps even gone their separate ways. If one of them 
was unsaved. You see? We've taken and we've poured our life into them. I don't want a religious teen daughter. Okay? I want a godly one. We can have religious people all over the place. We can have people with good morals and good ethics. It does not mean they're saved. You see, the Bible teaches that we are belonging to one of two families. You either belong to Satan or God. And there is no middle ground. Now, the unbelieving religious crowd in John chapter number 8 thought they belonged to Jesus Christ. And they continued to argue with him. And they said, well, you know what? Uh, we're of our father Abraham. And Jesus said, you know what? Ye are of your father, the devil. Wow. What a statement. Among whom we also all had our conversation in times past. We conducted our lives in the realm of what Satan desired. We are part of Satan's family. I don't want to be there. And I don't think anybody here would want to be there. What's a shame is that many would sacrifice all of eternity based on public opinion. I've heard so many people say, so many teachers or young people say to me in the school and growing up, well, what do you think everybody, what do you think my friends will think if they learn I'm not saved? If you've got a friend who doesn't rejoice in your salvation, it's a lousy friend to begin with. Leave them. Amen. Okay? There's a serious issue with that whole premise to begin with. Well, what do you think the church people, they all think I'm saved. You think they think you're saved. You might be the only one who thinks that. Everybody else might be praying for your salvation. It's quite an incredible thought. Don't allow what someone else could think of you to alter where you will spend an eternity because you're going to go there somewhere, sometime, and I don't know when. And it is quite possible that tonight is your last opportunity because you may not make it through this night. I have no doubt where I'm going. That matter has been settled. How do we become a child of God? I'd like you to turn over in your Bibles to Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. Notice verse number 26. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 26. And we find out how we become a child of God. Galatians 3 verse 26. For ye are all the children of God. What are these next two words? By faith in Christ Jesus. You can't earn this. You might be able to do all sorts of things and you might be better than your friends. You might be better than your neighbor. You might be better than any person you point to. The problem is that your standard is flawed because God demands perfection. And I think every one of us in here will acknowledge very quickly eh, we're not perfect. Okay, uh, We might joke and try to uh, convince someone that we are as close to perfection as possible. <laughs> I can assure you we are a long way away from perfection and there are little things that will just very quickly remind us of that. The means by which someone becomes a child of God is faith, but it is faith that has to be placed in a certain location. Faith in the wrong location may very well send someone to an eternity in hell. There are people who have their faith in their religious system. They'll make the statement, well, I go to church. Well, pat yourself on the back, so do I, four times a week. Okay? What does it mean? It means you go to church. Do you drive a car too? Yeah, great, pat yourself on the back again. None of these things matter. Your faith is in the wrong place. Faith said, well, you know what, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Your faith is in your works. Again, another problem. 
Your faith has to be put in its right location. The object of your faith will determine your eternity. Faith placed in Christ Jesus. If it is any other place, you're not going there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, absolutely not a single individual, comes to the Father but by me. If you want to get to God the Father, you've got to go the way that he said you've got to go. All roads don't lead to heaven. One road does. All the other roads lead to hell. And that is the reality. Well, that's not very nice. It's true. And it's the best thing that I can tell you. Because there is an answer. And that answer is found in Jesus Christ. And as a believer, I sit here today and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt because of the work that God's Spirit does with my spirit that I am on my way to heaven. That I am a child of God. Let me ask you this tonight. Do you have that kind of assurance? If you don't, why don't you? It's a question you'd better answer because it's a question on which all of eternity is going to handle on which all of eternity is going to be hinged. If you have any questions about it, see me tonight. We'll get the matter settled. There's no reason to not do so. Okay? You have no idea how long God will give you. Now, this place that believers enjoy is a place of or let me say it this way, the, the position in which believers enter by faith. Number one, it's a position of security. Romans chapter 8 is going to continue on, and we're going to uh, get to it eventually in this study, but it's going to continue on and talk about the certainty of our glorification. You know what? I've lost a lot of things in my life. <laughs> Man, it's amazing. The tools that I have lost. It's just absolutely amazing. You know how hard a Phillips screwdriver is to actually find Okay, I've got all sorts of flat screws, but where's the Phillips? Where, who, where is it? And I can blame my children, and you know, it's not always their fault, but my dad blamed me growing up, so I blame my kids growing them, with them growing up. It's just what naturally happens. Now, some things I know belong to them, like my favorite hammer that got chewed by the dog. <laughs> you laugh, man, that, that hammer put many meals on a table, and now it's handle. It's a fiberglass handle, and it just, it just gets splintered. Oh, man, it was the best one I had. It bounced off so many roofs and survived so many things, and it didn't get past the dog. <laughs> okay. How many things have you lost in your life? A lot. Some of us just forget about all the things we lost because we lost our memory. Uh, you know, let me say this. God has never lost a single person. And he never will. Those who have been saved, as Romans chapter 8 is going to go on and state, are guaranteed to be glorified. God doesn't lose anybody in the process. I lose track of people. People fall through the cracks. We had it happen in the school system. You would have a student who wasn't bad, but they weren't good. They were just the in-between. You know what happens to them? They fall in the cracks. The really bad kids get the attention. The really good kids get the attention. The okay kids get the, who are you? Okay? They're non-existent. This happens in life. God doesn't do that. It's a position of security. John chapter 10, verse 28. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man, including yourself, is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Once you are saved, you are in Jesus Christ's hand who is in turn in God's hands. Amen. You are saved and you're saved for all of eternity. It's a position of security. Number two, it's a position of responsibility. Having been saved, you don't have the right to do as you please. 
say, well, I want to do this. Guess what? From a biblical standpoint, I don't care what you want and neither does God. Because the Christian life and even life in general does not revolve around what you want. This is a very difficult reality for many teenagers to actually learn. For them, the sun is not the center of the solar system. They are. Everything revolves around them. Guess what? A boss could care less what you think. My boss tells me all the time, I don't pay you to think. <laughs> I tell him in response, it's a good thing because you'd be broke. <laughs> all right? But, you know, your job is not to think. Your job is to drive this vehicle to this location. Think in the process. Okay? But you don't have to worry about everything else. It doesn't, the life does not revolve around you. It's not about you being able to do whatever you want to do. Those who have been saved have a different calling. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. I'd like for you to turn to this passage as well. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. You'll find an incredible statement here. Quite an incredible challenge for us all. Ephesians chapter 5, notice verse number 1. Here's the statement. You want to say, well, I've got the right to do however I please. Well, here's what God says you're supposed to do. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. When we think of a follower, we think of a long line of people where you've got a file, single file, and all of that like you used to have to do in school, line up to go to the drinking fountain, and everybody's sitting there in line, can't talk, can't do anything, and uh, all of this stuff, and the teacher knows they got eyes in the back. That's not it. Let me use the word imitators instead. You in your life imitate God. What a standard. Let me ask you this. Would God do what you're doing? Would God talk like you talk? Would God listen to the music you listen to? Would God dress the way you dress? Would God react to people the way you react to people? Aren't you thankful we all know the answer to that's no? <laughs> and a single one of us would be alive today if God reacted to people the way I react to people. Ah, oh, you idiot. <laughs> okay. Be done with him. Okay. Yeah, well, let's move on. All right. I mean, is this how God operates? No. It comes, this position, yes, it is a position that has incredible privilege and it's a position that has incredible security, but it is a position that has incredible responsibility. You imitate God. And if God's not doing it, what business do you have doing it if you are His child? This takes a whole lot of gray out in the Christian life. I love the people's definitions of Christian liberty. A little bit of black and a little bit of right and everything else is right in the middle and you can do whatever you want to do. No, totally backwards, totally backwards. Christian liberty is uh, me withholding stuff so that I don't offend someone else. Amen. Yes, I might have the right to do it, but I choose not to because it's going to be someone else's detriment. So I don't do it. That's Christian liberty. And we don't claim it that way today. But if God isn't doing it, why are you doing it? Peter instructs us, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. The standard, as he which hath called you, is holy. How holy is God? Mostly holy? Partially holy? A little holy? Holier than so-and-so? No. He is completely holy. He is entirely holy. He is the embodiment of holiness. That's your standard. So many times people draw encouragement from the fact, well, I'm not as bad as someone else. It's kind of a warped sense of getting encouragement. At least I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler. Wow. Way to be something in life. 
Way to aspire for something. Way to draw encouragement. Way to pick a role model. Okay? At least I'm not as bad as some of the NFL gurus who make millions and millions of dollars. Wow. You know, this is encouraging. None of my teenagers would ever say, well, Dad, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Really? Pat yourself on the back, I guess. Are you as good as God? Because until that standard is met, we've got a lot of work to do. You see, it's a position of security, but it's a position of responsibility. And as Romans chapter 8 is going to continue on, it is a position, lastly, of inheritance. And this is a pretty remarkable thought. Romans chapter 8, the Bible says that the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. If suggests a condition that is assumed to be true. It's really kind of a assumed to be true for the sake of discussion. It's like a, an argument term. Like we'll do it all the times with our, our children. Well, if I agree to this, not saying I am agreeing to it, but if for your sake of discussion I happen to agree to this, then. Now, for a believer, this is true. For a believer, we've already stated in verse 16 that you are the children of God. The believer is. So for me, I can put instead of the word if, I can put the word since. I am a child of God. And look at what I have coming. If children, then heirs. The idea is that you are a beneficiary of something. What is it that you are going to receive? Peter described our inheritance as being incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It is an inheritance that is incorruptible. In other words, it is not subject to decay. Go buy a car, it'll rust and break. Buy a house, it'll fall to pieces, especially after you buy it. <laughs> okay? Everything that we place so much of our life in and so much of our value system in is corrupt. But the inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ is one that is not subject to decay. It is one that is said to be uh, undefiled. In other words, it is pure. It has not been contaminated by sin in any way. What you will find is that everything that you have ever inherited in this life has in some way been contaminated by sin. Everything. Absolutely everything. But the inheritance that awaits us as believers is an inheritance that has not ever been contaminated by sin. The Bible says that it is one that, is, uh, that fadeth not away. Uh, it is, in other words, or undefiled. That's a word that is going to come along and it suggests that it will never lose its pristine quality. It is eternal bliss. It's not going to fade and diminish away. It goes on. Uh, and it says, describes it uh, again as one that it fadeth not away. It doesn't ever lose its quality. Then it says, it is reserved in heaven for you. Who's that? I'm one of them. Why? Because I am one of those, you who are kept by the power of God. Why am I still saved today? Because I place my trust in Jesus Christ, and as a result, God's power keeps me. Not because I'm doing something great, not because I'm all this and then some. God's power keeps me. He goes on and he describes this inheritance, and he says, We are, if children, we are heirs. Every time I read this passage, I feel as though Paul sets his pen down for a moment and ponders what he just wrote. And he restates it in slightly different form. Heirs. 
In case you didn't get it, you are a beneficiary of something or someone of whom, let me qualify it, says Paul, you are an heir of God. That's an inheritance. That's an incredible inheritance. I assume I'm in my dad's will. To my knowledge, I am. I don't think I've been cut out of it. Okay? I hope I haven't. <laughs> Dad, if you're listening to this, call me. But no, anyway, uh, you know, you take a look. I, I am going to receive part of an inheritance. Am I going to become a multimillionaire? Uh, no. I might own a whole lot of books. But guess what? Everything that I get is subject to decay. Everything. My life isn't wrapped up in that. I am an heir of God. And here then is the logical conclusion. You remember we've talked about the word that's oftentimes not translated on the one hand. You've got it right here. On the one hand, you are an heir of God. On the other hand, you are a joint heir or a fellow heir with Jesus Christ. Now, follow the logic of what Paul has just developed. Jesus, throughout this passage, is clearly God's son. Believers, as we saw last week, have been adopted into the very family of God. When we were adopted into the family of God, we are presently sons of God. If Jesus is the son of God, and if you and I are sons of God, what does that make us? Brothers. It's an amazing truth. It's developed in Hebrews chapter number Two, we just uh, went through this recently on Wednesday night. Here's the statements that are made. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Listen closely. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. The one who sanctified is Jesus Christ, and those who are sanctified are believers, and we're all one. For which cause, because of that, he, Jesus Christ, is not ashamed to call them believers brethren. <laughs> Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call me his brother. I've got a brother who's ashamed to call me his brother. Okay? Jesus, however, is not ashamed. What an amazing statement. He goes on and it actually quotes then from the Old Testament saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In other words, Jesus talking to God the Father saying, I, Jesus Christ, will declare God's name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, there's another quote. I will put my trust in him. And behold, I and the children which God hath given me, you and I are joint heirs. We are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. Eternity. Eternity is the focus. Here's the most important question that you will ever answer. Where are you going to spend it? Is God the Holy Spirit confirming in your heart that you are a child of God? Or is God the Holy Spirit working in your heart so that you will become a child of God? If the latter is the case, by all means, accept Him tonight. The other point or one of the other points that I made is that thinking of eternity and looking beyond the things which are seen to the things that are not seen causes us to evaluate where our life is truly wrapped up. Matthew chapter 6, and I'll close with these verses. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. And here is the clinching statement of that entire passage. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You want to know what kind of an investment you're making? Take a look at where your heart is now. If your heart is in what you can accomplish 
and then all of the things that you can own, all the things you can possess, and then your rights and all the things you get to do, you don't have the right goals. And you will find that the entire treasure in which you wrapped your life up in will amount to absolutely nothing. And you will die one day and walk out of life with the same stuff that you came into life with. I hope that when you cross the threshold of eternity, you will one day join me in that chorus that sings, Worthy is the Lamb. If you're not going to be there, see me tonight, because I'll be more than happy to tell you how you can be there. For those of us who are, rejoice in the fact that the Holy Spirit testifies that you are his child. If you're a child of God, you're an heir. Let's pause and ponder. That means you are an heir of God. And it also means you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. What an incredible position of security and what an incredible position of responsibility. God saved you so that you can live a life for Him. If you don't want to, there's a problem in your heart. Let's pray, Father.